Now that we have the framework for the world in place, we'll bring in Dave. But first, I want to make a small correction to our SDL initialization from last time. I forgot to call SDL quit after the game loop ends. Now let's think about Dave. Any actor will need to know their location. In our world, that means Dave must have an X position and a Y position. Now since Dave can move with pixel precision, we should probably track both world grid and pixel positions. Now they're directly related and we'll need to keep them in lockstep to avoid inconsistencies. We'll draw Dave in the render function. But since drawing Dave isn't directly related to world drawing, I want to split up render into sub-procedures for each task. So let's move our code from last time into a draw world procedure. Then we'll add a draw Dave. Move the old code to draw world. I think render should probably draw clear before each frame, so let's move our init code to do that. So render now clears the back buffer, draws the world, draws Dave, then swaps the frame buffers. Dave needs a destination in the world. Let's find a good tile for him. I think he starts around the 50s. Alright, tile 56 is a neutral tile that should work until we get animations in. That tile was 20 by 16. Now on level 1, Dave starts in front of that pipe at grid position x2, y8. We'll also calculate his pixel position from the grid position by multiplying by tile size. Test build. Uh, it would help if I didn't just copy prototypes from the header. Let's give these parameters names. build and run and Dave is there but he's stretched out let's see uh, this is supposed to be the height property and there's Dave but now we need some logic to drive him let's go back to check input and connect Dave to the keyboard I'm going to take out our code from last time since we won't be scrolling the world anymore. In fact, I'm going to change the way we access the keyboard by reading the keyboard scan codes directly. Now, I always feel like this gives me a better response in the game loop. One good idea is to always separate the detection from the action. We don't want to move Dave directly in the check input code, but we should set a flag to tell our engine to try to move Dave later on. So we'll set up two stages of flags. The first tells the engine to try to move Dave. The second happens after we validate that action and tells Dave to actually do the moving. Let's plug the first series of flags into the keyboard. Now update game needs to process our movement attempts. So update game is already getting cluttered with code that does several different things. Let's clean that up first. This level changing code is obsolete now that we've removed world movement. This code here scrolls the screen state, so we'll separate that out. I'll put it below render. Let's add move Dave before screen scrolling. Add the new functions to the header. So now that we have some input and a place where we'll put the movement code, we should do something else first. We need to validate that input before we do the actual movement. Let's add a function for that at the beginning of update. This is where we'll kill input that doesn't make sense, like Dave trying to move right if he's already up against a wall. We set the try variables in check input, and this function sets the movement variables if they make sense. Right now, everything makes sense since we haven't built in any collision detection, so we'll just pass everything through to the action variables for now. In our movement code, we'll make Dave move two pixels if the movement is set. I'll skip jump for now. We have to add verify input to the header.
build and run. And Dave is moving. Actually, he keeps on moving because we never cleared the input. Let's clear the input after all updates are finished. Plug that code block into our loop after the last update. Alright, so Dave is moving right even when I push left. Let me check our movement code. Ah uh, yeah, this should be a subtraction. Okay, Dave is now moving on the horizontal plane. Now let's keep him from going through barriers. Now this means we need a collision checking system. Collision checking should come before we validate input just to be sure that we're working with the latest state of the game. Now in our game struct, I'm going to add an array of 8 elements that will serve as a boolean check for obstructions. I'll probably go with a value of 1 to mean that the point is clear and 0 to mean there's a barrier. Here's the collision check function. So how this will work is that we'll check 8 points around Dave at roughly these locations. Now the points on the left and right are towards the center because this will allow Dave to move into tight spaces. Otherwise the player will need pixel perfect precision with all motion. It's not very player friendly to make an exact box. So for each point we'll check if it's clear using a helper function that returns 0 or 1. I'll pass the game struct and the pixel position to that point relative to the Dave sprite origin, which is top left. I'll hard code these points as offsets here starting at the top left and going clockwise. Point zero is at plus four and I'll put it at minus one. I add the other seven points. Points three and four are plus eleven for x and four and twelve for y. Point 4 is plus 10 plus 16, 5 is plus 3 plus 12, 7 is plus 3 plus 4. I'll also throw in a sort of a macro variable that is set if Dave is on the ground by checking points 4 and 5. Now we'll need to make an isClear helper function. It simply looks up the input position on the world grid and checks the tile type there. Let's find the tile numbers that Dave can't walk through. One, three, five, basically 15 through 24 29 and 30 anything else will return true looks like Dave can still walk through walls uh, we didn't add collision checks to the verify input procedure Dave still walks through the walls because we didn't add collision checks to the game loop. That's it. Now we can't walk through obstructions. So let's think about jumping. 
We already added the top points to collision checking, but I want to add double jump protection. So to simulate a jump, we use a timer that starts at some positive number and will increase upward movement at a decaying rate. So if the space above Dave is clear, then Dave will move up two pixels if the timer is greater than five. Otherwise, he'll move up once. If the timer is zero, then we'll stop the jump. Well, it worked, but that's some serious vertical. Let me set up our new variables with some default values. So Dave needs to come back down after he jumps. We'll add a new function that applies gravity to Dave. In the original game, Dave was the only entity that had gravity applied to him. Everything else hovers, and the enemies are on rails. So if Dave isn't jumping, and he's not on the ground, then we'll check just below his bounding box and move him down two pixels. Now there's a potential problem with alignment when you jump multiple pixels. So I want the failure test to always make sure that Dave is tile aligned if he's not falling. Basically locked to the tile that requires the least amount of alignment shift. All right, there we go. Dave can now jump around the world. Let's handle pickups. So in our is clear routine, we'll check if any of the collision points hit a tile type that matches a pickup. I have those types written down here, so I'll plug those in. So if we do have a hit, then we'll set up a new grid pair variable that will signal the update routine to pick up something at that location. But be aware that if multiple pickups trigger, then only the last one checked will be picked up in that frame. The next one will be detected again in the next frame and should be picked up then. Now there's a small chance that it could be missed if Dave ever happens to move away at the exact same frame. Very unlikely case, but it does exist. Let's make a pickup routine that will swap the tile value to zero and will eventually add the score. If the pickup variables are zero, just return. Swap it out and reset the grid variables. Guess I need parentheses around type. And I need to zero out the tile. It helps if we plug in our pickup routine to the game loop. And Dave is now picking things up. So let's deal with that ugly black box around him.
Each Dave sprite comes with a matching mask. Now, a modern solution is to use SDL blend modes to remove the alpha channel on the Dave sprite. One problem we have is that SDL load bitmap doesn't create a surface with an alpha channel. So instead, I'm going to write the white background to the Dave sprite and key that white background to, to, as transparent in SDL. And you may wonder if we'll also lose other white colors that are part of the sprite, and the answer is no, because when we did our 6-bit to 8-bit conversion, the result was that none of our sprites actually contain true white colors. So if we're on a Dave sprite, we'll load the mask sprite. Create a new surface for both the mask and Dave. Run through the mask and set the Dave surface to white wherever the mask isn't black. Key the white transparency. Copy to texture. Free our working surfaces. Test build. Fix a couple of typos. Figure out this seg fault. Oh, I forgot to change the file name up here. Unsafe string functions beware. There we go. Dave now moves around without the ugly black box. Let's make sure all the Dave sprites match up to their masks. Now the number of sprites in the sequence has to be hard coded because the order doesn't really make sense. If I had chosen to work with a sprite sheet, I probably would have stored the masks next to the sprites to make this job easier. Let's test one more time. Dave moves, jumps, and picks things up. Next time we'll push Dave along his journey and build up his capabilities.